If you watch the Netflix series The Queen's Gambit, you've probably heard of chess grandmaster Bobby Fischer. While media like The Queen's Gambit drew inspiration from his life, the real Bobby Fischer story is much stranger than fiction. Today, we're exploring the fascinating and bizarre life of Bobby Fischer. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. And feel free to leave a comment and let us know what other historical events you would like to hear about next time. Okay, let's set up the board. Picture this. The year is 1943 in the great city of Chicago. This is the day Bobby Fischer enters the world stage. Unfortunately, he didn't get the backstage pass, more like the nosebleed section at another stadium. His mother, Regina, was originally from Moscow. With an IQ bigger than Einstein's, she would go on to become a renowned biophysicist. At that time, she had fortunately lacked a permanent home, but she wasn't one to let life play her like a pawn. She traveled around, eventually making her way to Brooklyn in 1949. A few years later, her son would become fascinated by chess, first by playing with his sister, then by studying a book of chess games he found while on vacation. In 1956, young Bobby used his genius to become a chess prodigy. At age 13, he was crowned the youngest American junior champion. He continued his winning streak, going on to become the youngest Grandmaster title holder at only 15 years old. Geez, at 15? Most people are lucky if you can talk to your crush for one minute without flop sweating. Some people are born geniuses, like Nikola Tesla, Marie Curie, and Michael Bay. And despite all his quirks, Bobby Fischer was one of them. While studying at Brooklyn's Erasmus Hall, Fischer took an IQ test where some sources say he scored as high as 195. Yet even with that great intelligence, Bobby Fischer wasn't a great student. In school, he regularly got Ds and didn't quite fit in socially. With feelings of isolation, it didn't come as any surprise that he decided to drop out in 1960. He never went to college, nor did he attend any other academic institutions. Of course, if you were a 15-year-old chess grandmaster, you'd probably skip college too. For most of his life and career, Fischer dominated the world of chess. But in 1972 in Reykjavik, Iceland, he met his match against the world chess champion, the Soviet Union's own Boris Spassky. To say the championship was a big deal would be an understatement. Beyond the obvious Cold War ramifications of the match, the Soviet Union dominated the game internationally for over 30 years, considering chess a shining example of their communist intellectual superiority. Fischer, however, was critical of the Soviets, accusing Soviet players of deliberately drawing their matches. He also demanded that officials forbid cameras and hold the match away from the prying eyes of spectators. The officials refused. So, Fischer got feisty and recklessly lost his first game. Then, he stunned the world by forfeiting the second. As the championship hung in the balance, Fischer prepared to board a flight back to the U.S. That's when, among many others, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger urged him to continue playing. And because Spassky agreed to play Game 3 in a small back room, the tournament continued on. Who knew Kissinger was so into chess? Hmm, he does have giant glasses. Over the next eight games, Fischer won five and drew three, winning with a 12.5 to 8.5 victory. He became the 13th world champion and the first American to win since 1886. Bobby Fischer was sort of like the Where's Waldo of the chess world. Incredibly renowned, but nearly impossible to find. Following his 1972 victory, Fischer refused to play by the official rules for his upcoming defense against Anatoly Karpov. So Karpov received the title by forfeit, and Fischer went off the radar. Steadfastly refusing interviews or official inquiries, he essentially gave up on the millions of dollars from endorsements that came with being a world chess champion. But he did give a bunch of money away to his favorite televangelist. Fischer renounced Judaism in the 1960s and became a devotee of a religious sect known as the Worldwide Church of God. And this sect would give Jerry Falwell a run for his dirty money. As one of the many fundamentalist Christian televangelist programs that came from Southern California, this church was into some seriously apocalyptic predictions. And Fischer wasn't just a casual fan either. 
he gave them $61,000 of his 1972 prize money. But just like most of these sects, things went south. Pastor Garner Ted Armstrong had a habit of getting caught in some not-so-church-friendly activities, and Fisher became so disillusioned he stopped contributing money to their cause. When Fisher did appear in public, his behavior took a turn for the strange. He moved to California, where he was mistaken for a bank robber and arrested for vagrancy. But who hasn't been wrongfully detained for a major felony, right? He even wrote about it in a 1982 essay titled, I Was Tortured in the Pasadena Jailhouse. Johnny Cash must have heard that one and thought, dang, that's a great title. Descriptions of Bobby Fischer paint him as delusional and paranoid. He ranted about the U.S. government, indulged in conspiracies, and disregarded international sanctions on a whim. But there might have been more to the story. It turned out that Bobby Fischer and his mother were both under FBI surveillance as far back as 1942, and the file for Fischer's mother extended over 750 pages, longer than any book we're willing to read. While Fischer's mom was born in Switzerland, she descended from Russia and Germany. And when an FBI informant read letters outlining her leftist political beliefs, they naturally suspected that her inner circle was a bunch of communists. Following her death, journalists accessed her FBI file, which showed that Bobby was also under FBI surveillance, with the Bureau considering him a potential KGB recruit. Of course, this prospect seems laughable, considering Fisher was an anti-communist who despised the Soviets and their system of government. Did you see how he treated the Soviet champion? Speaking of which, of the many interesting stories about Bobby Fischer, just one of them involves dental work. According to official biographer Frank Brady, Fisher had his dental fillings removed for traditional periodontal reasons. But there's a persistent urban legend, corroborated by acquaintance Ron Grass, that Fisher actually did it to prevent the Soviets from transmitting manipulative radio signals. Grass said this about his friend, I noticed that he was favoring his mouth, and he told me that he'd had some work done on his teeth. He'd had a dentist take all the fillings out of his mouth. I said, Bobby, that's going to ruin your teeth. Did you have him put plastic in the holes? And he said, I didn't have anything put in. I didn't want anything artificial in my head. He'd read about a guy wounded in World War II who had a metal plate in his head that was always picking up vibrations, maybe even radio transmissions. He said the same thing could happen from metal in your teeth. So, yeah, it seems unlikely that Fisher was a Soviet spy, considering he was so paranoid about being spied on by Russia that he may have had all the metal fillings pulled out of his head. Fisher abandoned the world of competitive chess for almost 20 years. But in 1992, a shadowy businessman and friend to autocrat Slobodan Milosevic agreed to put up $5 million to sponsor a Spassky Fischer rematch in Yugoslavia. In the rematch, Fischer quickly overcame Spassky, who was no longer a top player. And though he won about $3 million from the match, he made an enemy of the U.S. government, which was sanctioning Yugoslavia for its genocidal violence. But Fischer didn't care. In fact, he publicly spat on the U.S. Treasury letter warning him of the consequences of participating in the match. Bobby Fischer, the human llama of chess. And he was not done spitting on things. The events of September 11, 2001, will forever live in our collective minds as one of America's greatest tragedies. But there was at least one person who decided it was a good thing. Bobby Fischer. Only a few hours following the devastating attack, Fisher called a small Filipino radio station for a live interview, telling them the tragedy was wonderful news and that he applauded the act. But his tirade didn't stop there. He added his opinion that Jewish people were responsible for bringing on the attacks. His comments acted as one of the final nails in the coffin of his reputation and would haunt him for the rest of his life. Following the infamous Yugoslavia match, which violated an order from President George H.W. Bush, Fisher became a wanted man. His passport was canceled in 2003, and a subsequent warrant was issued for his arrest. So Fisher moved, or should we say fled, around the world. When he attempted to leave Japan, officials detained him at the request of the U.S. government. At that point, Fisher begged Icelandic parliament to grant him citizenship and extricate him from a Japanese prison. It took over nine months, but Iceland relented, making him a citizen. There, the former chess champion would live out the rest of his days before dying of kidney failure in 2008. He was 64, the exact number of squares on a standard chessboard.
By the time Fisher died, he had a fortune worth around $2 million from his chess career. So, naturally, a legal fight over his money ensued. Fisher's former girlfriend, Marilyn Young, claimed her daughter, Jinky, was actually Bobby Fisher's biological daughter, so she filed a paternity suit. Young and Fisher got together while he lived in the Philippines, but by the time he died, he was an Icelandic citizen. Fisher didn't leave a will, so according to Icelandic law, the nine-year-old girl would be entitled to Fisher's estate, but that would only be valid if she were his actual biological daughter. Then things got a bit more complicated. A Japanese woman, Miyoko Watai, claimed that she and Fisher were married in 2004, entitling her to his estate. Two of his nephews sued, claiming the marriage wasn't legal and that since they were the closest relatives, the right to Fisher's money was theirs and theirs alone. So how did it all shake out? Eventually, the Icelandic court allowed Bobby Fisher's remains to be exhumed, and a DNA test later confirmed that Jinky was not, in fact, his biological daughter. Then Iceland declared Fisher's marriage to Watai was legal and dismissed his nephew's legal claim. A complicated endgame for a world-class player. So what do you think? What's your take on Bobby Fisher's story? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.